Man, this is a crazy story. This legend was threatened at knife point by a gang of terrorists. Um, this artist had to keep calm if he was going to save his life and his wife who was with him. So along with his wallet, he handed over a bag containing two of his most prized possessions. There was a notebook of lyrics and a demo tape of songs for his new album, neither of which he had copies of. Uh, these thieves, having no idea who was standing in front of him, stole one of the greatest hits of the 70s. After surviving the ordeal, this musical genius knew that he either had to track down the stolen lyrics and tape, or he'd have to try to remember it and recreate it. Find out what happened next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember writing the lyrics down while listening to your favorite song because they weren't in the liner notes, I did that all the time. I'd play and pause the tape and write down as I was going along. If you do that, make sure to subscribe below right now. You'll love this channel. Story straight from the legends, nostalgia all the time. Also, check us out on Patreon. That helps us curate this history and you get even more content. So it's time for another edition of our series, The New Standards. This is a show that takes an in-depth look into songs that transcend genre, decade, and fads. You know, songs that are monumental touchstones in our culture and in our society. Previous episodes, we've covered Sundown by Gordon Lightfoot, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, and Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Sundown, you better take care. But today, we're going to take a deep dive into one of the, the coolest song stories ever. I love this story. It's Paul McCartney and Wings and their hit, Band on the Run. Band on the Run. From London to Nigeria, Paul McCartney got a call from his drummer, Denny Sywell, and the news was not good. There would be one less member than expected taking the trip. Uh, Denny was not going to come. He was actually quitting the band. Uh, that was actually two bandmates gone in as many weeks. Shortly before that, Wings had suffered its uh, first split in the ranks when guitarist Henry McCullough uh, angrily walked out on the band. Almost overnight, Wings had gone from being a sturdy fivesome to a shaky trio. Uh, actually, the remaining three members were Paul and his wife Linda on keyboards and then Denny Lane on guitar and bass. Wings was, of course, McCartney's first post-Beatles music venture, I'm not counting his solo stuff. Uh, the band was formed as a quartet during the summer of 1971. Paul, Linda, and the two Dennys. Wings' debut, Wild Life, was indifferently received by critics and was even regarded by McCartney himself as a disappointment. Do the words you and me. At the end of 1971, Wings would then add Henry McCullough. Uh, early in 1973, Wings scored a double number one hit in the U.S. with their album Red Rose Speedway and the track My Love. And uh, later in the year, they enjoyed more transatlantic chart success with the theme from uh, the James Bond movie Live and Let Die, which we covered a few months ago. I know my heart can stay with my love. But now the band was whittled down to just three members. Uh, the discontent within Wings had been stewing for quite some time. For all McCartney's protests, to the contrary, for the most part, the band, uh, Democratic in name only, <laughs> Paul clearly still reserved the right to veto any musical decision that he disagreed with. Said Lane, let's be honest, he wanted to be in a band, in a sense, but he would still have the final call. How could you argue with Paul McCartney, <laughs> right? And Paul even said it himself. The thing is, if you come out of the Beatles and you go into another group, you're not just anyone. You're the guy out of the Beatles. It was just natural for me to try and run the band in the way that I saw fit. When Denny Sywell told McCartney that he wasn't coming to Africa, Paul was shocked. Sywell didn't believe the band was ready to record so soon after McCullough's departure anyway. And you know, beyond that, he was only earning 70 pounds a week with Wings. That was a lot less than the $2,000 a week he could be making in New York as a session guy. So he was out. Now, this was an unexpected blow. You know, fuming, he thought, well, thanks. Nice. Thanks for letting me know in plenty of time. Right. We're going to show you. 
Having consistently recorded Abbey Road Studios during his time with the Beatles, Paul was increasingly drawn to the idea of recording at new locations. Since EMI had studio facilities dotted around the globe, uh, Paul McCartney asked the staff at the label to compile a list of their other locations. Among those that Paul considered, uh, Bombay, India, Beijing, China, and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. But a growing interest in African rhythms won the day, and he settled on Lagos, Nigeria. Paul figured it would be something of a carefree getaway. We thought, great, lie on the beach all day, doing nothing, breeze into the studios, and record. But that daydream couldn't have been further from the truth. Uh, actually, their plane touched down on African soil on August 30th, 1973. The Wings party included Paul and Linda, their kids, there was Denny Lane and, and engineer Jeff Emmerich. But the group suffered severe culture shock from the get-go, really. It was the monsoon season in Nigeria, which uh, brought heavy storms and oppressive heat. And then the scene at the, the airport was one of forbidding military presence. It was machine gun-toting soldiers, you know, stalking the terminal. Nigeria in the summer of 1973 was a dangerous, volatile place, uh, divided by civil war only three years earlier than that. At this point, there had been nearly three million casualties from the effects of conflict, disease, and starvation. Conditions in the city were tense, you know, rife with corruption and a military government in control. On their trip to the studio, they were shocked to witness a traffic fatality, open sewers, and uh, bandage-wrapped lepers roaming the streets. They'd never seen anything like it. I mean, no one there batted an eye, though. This was daily life in this part of the country at that time. By the time the Wings entourage arrived at the EMI studio, it was clear that this trip was not going to be as happy-go-lucky as they had imagined. Uh, walking into something like an oversized shed, and the studio was substandard. It was a, it was a mess of out-of-date equipment. Some of it didn't even work. But rudimentary conditions notwithstanding, Paul and his crew you know, got to work. True to his upbeat nature, though, Paul McCartney threw himself into the recording process, moving from drums to guitar to bass to the microphone. Linda's contributions, even if only simple keyboard parts and the gentle harmonies, they were welcome improvements from her early days working with her husband. Things were going pretty swimmingly. However, studio limitations wouldn't be the only difficulty that they would contend with in Nigeria. Excited to explore the local nightlife, one night the McCartneys ventured out into the city on foot, against the advice of those more familiar with their surroundings. After Paul and Linda took to the streets, they were surprised when a car pulled up beside them. Uh, the driver rolled down his window and he offered the couple a ride. Paul smiled and said, no, no thanks. The car then drove up the road about another 20 yards and it stopped. The doors flew open and five henchmen jumped out, walking towards the couple. One pulled a knife and pointed right at the singer's throat. McCartney at knife point. Linda screamed, don't kill him, he's a musician. But Paul kept his cool. He handed over his wallet, he handed over a camera and a bag with a notebook full of lyrics and cassettes of Wings' new songs including a little ditty called Band on the Run. Band on the, run. the muggers made off with their valuables, but at least their lives were intact. What Paul would say is, we'd been told not to walk around, but we were just slightly hippie. Hey, don't worry, feel good and it's all right. So we got mug, crazy. All my recordings went and those were all the songs I'd written. The joke is, I'm sure the fellows who took it wouldn't know what it was. They probably recorded over it all. As we find out what happened next, because this is a pretty amazing story, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always wear on here. Make sure to download the new Zenny app to your phone to get their latest deals and to order whatever you want. So, you know, after losing the tapes, I mean, Paul McCartney knew that he had really two options. He could either track down the terrorists and the stolen lyrics and, and tapes, or he'd have to recreate the songs. Now, to this end, McCartney frantically tried to remember the songs he'd written. And this is where the genius tapped into his extreme musical superpower. He called this superpower his Beatle training. 
This is from when he and uh, John Lennon had no access to portable recorders. And Paul would try to commit the songs to memory because he just didn't have that. Now, despite this tragic, almost fatal turn of events, the music that the band had cut for their third studio album was a triumph. Paul was able to remember most of what he'd lost and even improve upon it. He would go on to say that he considers the Band on the Run album as his best post-Beatles work. I mean, what an incredible feat. Remembering the songs and, and you know, recreating them after such a traumatic event. Most of the tracks would ultimately be laid down in Nigeria over a period of six weeks. Afterwards, the band did some further overdubbing and mixing at George Martin's Air Studios in London. Despite the problems and technical limitations that Wings experienced in Nigeria, the end result of that album was exactly what Paul had been looking for. Uh, in this place, he'd found a new style for Wings, one that proved to be a clear transition from the 60s to the 70s. The the for the context of the album's title, uh, Paul envisioned himself, Linda, and Danny Lane as refugees, a band on the run. Now, at one point, Paul's overall aim may have been to create a concept album like Sgt. Pepper. However, you know, McCartney would say of the finished album that the tracks were connected by a common thread more than any conceptual theme. The album cover at least seems to be in a similar vein to Sgt. Pepper with its role playing and supporting cast of icons. as Paul, Linda, and Denny Lane. And they were shown in convict garb. Uh, caught in a prison spotlight together with six celebrity co-escapees. There was broadcaster and journalist Michael Parkinson, musician Kenny Lynch, uh, actor James Coburn, uh, broadcaster and politician Clement Freud, actor Christopher Lee, and professional boxer John Conta. The album consisted of nine tracks and included the singles Helen Wills, Jet, and Band on the Run. The album was released in the U.S. on uh, December 5th, 1973, to, to outstanding reviews. Paradoxically, the record made a slower chart ascent than any of its predecessors. Uh, it took seven months to reach number one in the U.K., though it stayed in the charts for 124 weeks. In America, it reached number one three separate times and eventually went triple platinum. It was also the best-selling album in Britain in 1974, and by the end of that year, it had sold more than 6 million copies worldwide. It was a huge album. Although initial sales of the album were actually disappointing, its performance dramatically improved thanks to its two hit singles, Jet, and of course, today's song, Band on the Run. Band on the Run. Band on the Run is Paul McCartney's longest solo single clocks in at five minutes and nine seconds. And it goes without saying that he packs a lot in this song. I mean, this song is a bold three-part medley. The first section is a slow reflective ballad that laments being trapped behind four walls. You know, this sets the scene for the song's running theme, prisoners escaping from their fate. Inside these four walls. And then the song shifts gears into a second section, this is Driving Rock, which acts as a, a bridge leading into a country-flavored chorus, you know, proclaiming the anthemic Band on the Run theme. Now, McCartney said the title of the song refers to a group of people who have escaped prison. Uh, they're a band of desperados, if you will. He said, certain aspects of it remind me of Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid. The Undertaker is ringing the bell because he's upset he has so few customers. Sailor Sam's a character out of Rupert Bear, uh, the comic strip by Mary Tortell, but he fitted in somehow. Elsewhere, McCartney called it a story song. A story song about chasing freedom. That's one of the great things about rock and roll. It does allow you to break some rules, is what Paul would say. Some asked Paul if the song was a reference to Wings escaping from the shadow of the Beatles. 
McCartney would answer, sort of, yeah. I think most bands on tour are on the run. He would explain that Band on the Run was symbolic, paraphrasing what he said. Uh, when the Beatles started out, they were just kids who only knew a few chords. Their ambitions were very simple at first. They figured being in a band would help them earn a bob or two so they could get a guitar and a nice car. But as they developed, everything blew up. The Beatles became a sophisticated machine, both musically and as a brand. It got to the point where it was about more than just the music. Business competed with art, so there was this feeling of, of wanting to escape. Like the song says, if we ever get out of here. If I ever get out of here. Actually, Paul explained that this lyric was inspired by a remark that George Harrison had made previous. Uh, this was during uh, one of the Beatles' never-ending business meetings, you know, when the fate of the band and their Apple company was being decided. Harrison was saying something about how they were all prisoners and made the comment, if we ever get out of here. That line really stuck with Paul McCartney. Thought of giving it all away to However, uh, the song and his theme of escape, it can be interpreted in other ways as well. I mean, whether personally for the McCartneys who had done battle with the law or drug use more than once, or, you know, fighting against societal convention and expectations as a rock and roll artist. The song has a lot to say. Let's just say that. I think we all feel like prisoners, you know, whether to our jobs or relationships, big brother or prisoners of our own device, namely technology. We are all just prisoners here of our own device. Music is that freedom that busts us out. Ultimately, McCartney wrote the song as a story to sum up the transition from captivity to freedom. There are countless ways of how you can apply that particular analogy. Released as a U.S. single in April of 74, Band on the Run became Paul's third non-Beatles song to top the U.S. Hot 100. Now, internationally, it went to number seven in the Netherlands and Ireland, went to number three in the U.K., number two in South Africa, and number one in New Zealand and Canada. A Band on the Run has also had several media placements, including The Killing Fields, uh, Outside Providence, Guitar Hero World Tour, The Simpsons, and also Boyhood. We got Band on the Run into My Sweet Lord, into Jealous Guy, into Photograph. Come on. Band on the Run has also been covered by Richie Havens, Hart, Ween, Ambrosia, Big Head Todd and the Monsters. It was also done by Foo Fighters on their cover album, Medium Rare. Actually, in 2010, without the Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl performed Band on the Run in the East Room of the White House in a concert honoring Paul McCartney. Uh, there, Paul McCartney had received the third Gershwin Prize for popular song from the Library of Congress. Uh, and the ceremony featured a host of leading world figures from various disciplines and various backgrounds. If I ever get out of here. There were artists from all different genres and backgrounds. Uh, there was Stevie Wonder and Faith Hill and Amy Lou Harris, uh, Herbie Hancock and Elvis Costello, a self-proclaimed number one fan of McCartney. Grohl jumped on stage to perform a swaggering version of Band on the Run with the house band. Uh, this is before launching into the song. Uh, he actually said, uh, you know, I have to say, I'm a native of the Washington, D.C. area. I've probably played every club and every basement and every arena and every stadium. And then, looking in the direction of Paul McCartney, he proclaimed, but all of that has nothing on playing to Paul. You're definitely my hero. Very cool. I'm playing to Paul. You're definitely my hero. Band on the Run is an album that my dad played all the time when I was a little kid, just discovering music. He told me stories about the lyrics and you know his interpretation of what he thought they meant. 
And it all came together years later when I was able to snag some tickets at the last second to take my dad to Paul live at Rio Tinto Stadium. And we heard a rousing rendition of this song. And then a few weeks later, after listening to the song over and over, after this concert, you know, my two-year-old son sang his first words. Mama, you. He was so cute. He's like, Mama, you. So, you know, as a dad, you understand. Mama, you. I recorded a video of it, and, and then a few weeks later, I lost all of my data uh, when I switched to a new phone. I'm still devastated by that because I lost a few months worth of pictures and videos from that concert with my dad. You know, but just like Paul lost the lyrics and the tape for, for the song, I still have the music. Therefore, I still have the memories. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Paul McCartney and Wings and Band on the Run. What do you remember about the song? Where does it rank in McCartney's extensive catalog? Is this his best solo offering? Tell us what you think below. Let's have a great discussion about one of the greats, total musical genius. If you like our content, make sure that you subscribe below so you never miss out on our daily videos. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>